Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Again, most people who follow the research will be very well aware that Alzheimer's disease disproportionately affects women. The answer that used to be thrown about was, well, that's because women live longer. Anybody who understands even first order mathematics will realize that the increase in expected lifespan of women does not fully explain that. So there must be something else. Do you think that it's the loss of hormones that explains the remainder of that gap? Or do you think it's even something beyond that? Yeah. So I would have answered that question just like you did with the age thing, you know, even five, six, seven years ago. And then it was one day on some television, something where someone kept elbowing me, someone named Maria, our friend Maria Shriver. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you got to figure it out. Why, why do women? No, no, no. Two out of every three brains of, of Alzheimer's are, are women's brains. And we don't know why. Isaacson, go figure it out. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'll go do it. I think I understand much better now. And in the category of likelihood is during the perimenopause transition, there are bioenergetic shifts in the brain that absolutely can predispose a woman to accelerated Alzheimer's pathology. And we call it the window of opportunity. During the perimenopause transition, if we can intervene the right way at the right time in the right woman, I believe that we can negate a reasonable amount, if not much of, careful with my words, of the negative impact of this precipitous drop of estrogen, which I believe is neuroprotective, again, the right type of estrogen, the right whatever, the natural estrogen I believe is protective. Whether we get into hormone replacement, that could you know be a different part of the conversation and, and which types and what this and what that. But the bioenergetic shifts during the perimenopause transition, you know, why do people have perimenopause? What are the symptoms? They get hot flashes, right? Night sweats. We can talk about that. Oh boy, night sweats. I don't know what you're talking about. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Irritability, never. No, no, I'm never. <laughs> so all of these different things. It's a brain disease. Perimenopause is a brain condition. It's those are those are manifestations of of the hormone withdrawal in the brain. And those are the symptoms that, you know, brain fog. Like I used to think, I'll just be very frank, I was completely dead wrong. Like women that had perimenopause and they had this brain fog thing. Ah, oh, maybe they're just not sleeping right. Maybe. Well, no, they're not sleeping right. And their their sleep is interrupted because of this bioenergetic shift. And heck yeah, you're going to have brain fog. And now we know what it looks like. Um, I hate that term brain fog. It's so nonspecific. You know, it's problems with processing speed and attention. And that's how I think of it. But perimenopause is a brain disease. So I think that's that's really important. And this bioenergetic shift is like it's like if you want to fast forward brain aging, like in a woman, in it, sorry, in a susceptible woman, because not all women are created equal, an E44 woman, a surgical menopause, meaning taking out the ovaries with the with the with the uterus, wow, that's that could do it. Now, I, I don't want to say this in all cases. It again depends on the individual person, but perimenopause transition is a huge unrealized risk factor for progression to dementia in an Alzheimer's susceptible woman. And just be careful and listen to those words because just because you're going through perimenopause does not mean you're going to get Alzheimer's, but in susceptible people, it is. And and I really believe that from a precision medicine perspective, we can intervene with specific hormones in specific ways. Is it a patch? Is it a gel? Is it a, you know, all these different things. Do you need a estrogen? What type of estrogen? From horses, from, you know, from, from natural, from what about progesterone? When do we add it? And these are, these are things that I talk, I talk to an OBGYN every other week now. I'm a neurologist. What the heck? So, so I could talk about this for a long time, but just, just know that the, the, this hormone thing is real. That's where you think the bulk of it is then Richard is it's less about the age gap or the age advantage, like, you know, the sort of lifespan advantage women have. And you think it's the elephant in the room is this enormous hormonal shift. I think that's the most underrecognized slash largest impact in a lot of women, but I have to take a step back and age is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's. Women plus age, so a 65 year old woman with the APOE4 with at least one or two APOE4 variants, that's like the perfect storm. Plus you add in this, you know, the perimenopause transition, 
But you know, there's individual things when it comes to a woman's life. So, for example, there's more widows than widowers, and widowhood is a astronomically important risk factor for cognitive decline and, and dementia. Also, women specifically with abdominal obesity. Let's talk, let's let's or, sorry, enlarged uh, waist circumference, visceral fat. As as the belly size gets larger, the memory center of the brain gets smaller. And we now know that in women specifically, women have a 39% increased risk of dementia when they have, you know, enlarged waist circumferences over a certain degree. And, and they're impacted more so than men. When I think of a woman and I think of body composition, I'm really paying attention to body fat. And I'm not just paying attention, I like weight, I don't care about. For women, I care about What's percent body fat and where is the fat? Is it visceral or is it otherwise? Cellulite on the thighs, I don't care. Oh, thank God. Belly fat, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. <laughs> you don't have cellulite on your thighs. <laughs> you're, you're on the Atia uh, Isaacson program. You're, thank goodness this is a podcast. No one you can see beat, it. You beat me in, in the spin class. You were, you were a did. hoss in there. I did. That was impressive. I was <laughs> dying. So where the fat is is key. Like in men, I really believe, and I think evidence is, is coming around to support this, but muscle mass in men is more important as opposed to body fat, especially visceral fat in women as a specific individual sex-specific risk factor towards Alzheimer's. So I was going to ask you about that, Richard. Do you think that part of the sex difference is that men have more lean mass than women? So it's that they have greater capacity for glucose disposal and that that could be an independent predictor beyond the loss of hormones? I don't know. I think we need to tease this out. You know, we're honestly doing one of the, if not the only, one of the very few studies where we're looking at, you know, pretty comprehensive brain imaging on on women and men between the ages of 40 to 65. Um, Lauren, you don't qualify yet because you're still a baby. Thank you. But, but one day um, you'll, you'll jump in. We're going to be able to answer this question, I hope, in the next five to seven to 10 years or sooner, but I don't know the answer to that question. 